Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethel this morning. Let's stand and praise the Lord together.
morning. Welcome once again to our worship service. We're so excited to worship and praise with you today. Um, we have a handful of announcements, starting with a reminder of our brand new Bible study, um, Mission Possible, um, with T Tim Tebow, and that'll be starting this Wednesday. You can join us downstairs live in the fellowship hall at 7 p.m. or via Zoom. And if you need that Zoom link, just reach out to the church and we'll get that to you. Um, reminder to continue to pray for and support our uh, food pantry. We still need shopping bags, your Meyer bags or Kroger bags, wherever you shop. Um, bring those in. We use those to uh, create our packages that we give out. So uh, keep our food pantry in prayer, and there's always an opportunity to support them either with food donations or with um, financial contributions. This Thursday is our regional prayer meeting, and so uh, Thursday night, uh, the entire folks from across the entire region get together via Zoom, and they pray for um, our communities, our churches, our families, our nation, our country, and um, it's a great time together in prayer, and so if you'd like to be a part of that, you can reach out to the office or ask Vince, and we can get you connected. Um, if you love the worship music as much as we do every Sunday, we do have a playlist. So just a reminder, you can scan that QR code and you can listen to uh, the songs we sing on Sundays throughout the week. And then uh, save the date for October 19th, our fall hayride. That'll be out at Real Life Farms in Canton. Um, and we will have a great time. We'll have uh, our hayride, some time in fellowship. There's all kinds of amazing, cute little animals. And it's just a fun time together. And we'll share a meal. Um, and then another save the date is um, coming a little bit sooner, and that is in a couple of Sundays, 922. Uh, Mike Williams, he was the comedian that was here last fall. Um, he's going to be preaching for us and sharing some things about his ministry and sharing our message that day. So make plans to be here and join us, or be sure to watch online if you can't be. Um, it's going to be a great service, I'm sure. And then a couple of other little uh, reminders. Camp LAL has their annual fall walk-run fundraiser, their 5K. Um, you can walk or you can run. And um, that is on September 14th up at Camp LAL. Joy is running this year, at least Joy. Walking quickly. Walking? Yeah, that's probably me too. I think I might do it. We'll see. Some of us will be out there moving. <laughs> but you can support us. Um, it is a fundraiser that helps offset the costs of camps and the things that they need. Um, and so there is a sign-up sheet to support out there. You can talk to Joy directly. And um, yeah, if you want to come and cheer people on or, or walk and be a part of it, um, it also has lunch with it as well. Should be a very special day. And then um, also for all of my singers out here at home, choir resumes this Thursday, September 5th. So we will meet here 7.30, right, Joy? Correct. 7.30 here um, in the sanctuary for choir, our first choir practice of the season, and we will start to prepare our music, and then very soon you will see our choir on Sunday mornings. And with that, would you please stand for our scripture this morning? The scripture today is 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, and with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. This is God's word.
Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord God, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this time together gathered to worship, to praise, to celebrate, to, to grow this body of believers, God. We are so thankful. We thank you for the summer that just ended and the fall that is ahead of us and the changing of the seasons. God, be with us today. Calm our hearts, still our minds, and open us to what you would have us hear, feel, and learn. We pray that our worship is anointed and pleases you, O oh Father. In your name we pray, amen. Please be seated. 
As we move into our time of offering and invite our ushers to come forward, we remind you that you can support the ministry of Bethel Baptist here in the sanctuary as our plates go by, or you can support us through our website or by mailing in uh, a donation. darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand as our ushers come forward. Jan Wilson will pray for our offering this morning. O oh Lord, giver of life and source of all freedom, I know that all that I have received is from your hand. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. And this we ask in your precious name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Children can meet right up here at the door with Miss Mandy for Children's Church. And now we can uh, pray for one another. How may we pray for you? Well, first off, we're going to lift up Don. Don has been moved. Uh, he, he, the medicine that he was given is not quite right. So now he's being under observation. And uh, that's where Donna is this morning. We want to pray for both Don and Donna.
How else can we pray for you this morning? We want to lift up Ian and the McGuire's in prayer. Ian went to the ER last night. He's, so, oh, I'm going to read a message. I'm all right, thankfully, but we're exhausted. Just wanted to keep you in the loop. Having severe stomach pains, aches, and other things. Doctors anticipated kidney stones, but he's at least severely dehydrated and has some digestive things going on. So keep right. Ian and the family in prayer. We're going to continue to pray for Art. Has Art been moved to yes. therapy now? Okay, so we can visit him, and he wants visitors. Oh, he's doing well. All right. All right. We want to pray for Barb Harness and Marie. And, and. Oh, and Tim, yes, Tim, and Tim. yeah. I had a friend that posted something on um, social media about, I, I don't know the situation, but she posted something about being at the hospital. So I don't know if she was there for herself or for a family member, her name's Jasmine. So just pray for her. Okay. We are thankful for the baptisms last weekend, and this week we are welcoming three people into membership. So, uh, Gary, you'll come up at, right after the sermon, and uh, we're going to welcome you into membership, and that's exciting for us, really exciting. And I heard a rumor about two other baptisms we're going to do at camp, is that rumor true? It's true. We have two more. So at camp, we're going to uh, get wet. All right. So that'll be just in a couple of weeks. So let us go to the Lord with these praises and petitions. Lord, we're thankful for all the baptism. We're so thankful for people standing up and identifying themselves with you. And We pray, Lord, for those who are sick that need your healing power we pray for those who are in mourning. You have heard all we've mentioned here this morning and also those that in our hearts that we have not mentioned. We just uh, lift up our people. We just lift up our church. We just lift up the church universal. Let your power and spirit move through us in such a way as the world will take notice and know that we're here. And we pray all of these things and open up our eyes and hearts to your scripture all this morning. And everyone said, amen. Amen. We are continuing our study of uh, Acts 1 Church, looking at the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to camp out in two places today at Scripture as we look, examine at each of the fruit of the Spirit. And today we're talking about patience. Uh, we will talk about patience. We'll define it biblically. We'll look at its opposite and see how we can um, have more patience in our life, be, have, have developed that fruit in our life. Our first stop is James 5. James 5, we find these words. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The Father waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door, as an example, brethren, of the suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Patience is not not losing your temper. Did I say that right? Patience is not not losing your temper. A lot of us think that if we don't lose our temper, we're, lose, we're, we're showing patience. That's, that's not strictly true. A lot of times, when we don't show our, our, our temper, we're, we're just counterfeiting patience. It's not real patience. It can be a counterfeit. Uh, some of us may call it delayed revenge, right? So in the moment, you smile. Oh, yes. But then you wait your time and bide for the proper moment. This is not patience. This is not patience at all. The problem with our world, as we sit down and encounter patience and think about patience developing in ourselves, is that this is true for Christians as well as not, right? We believe we know better than God. We believe we know better than God. And we couple that with a society that wants to be in a hurry. We're always in a hurry. We want things now. Good heavens. I have to wait Tell, you know, 30 seconds to pop that popcorn? I want it now, right? 
we are in a hurry and we believe we know better than God. There was a time in my 20s when I prayed, uh, and I would think along these lines, uh, Lord, Scripture says that I should have a wife. Scripture says that you've prepared someone for me, so why don't you give me a wife? That'd be my prayer. Now, the subtext there, which I haven't said out loud, but I'm just about to say out loud, the subtext there is, you incompetent God, you. That's the subtext of that prayer. I'm telling God that I know better than him about what I need for my life. I'm telling God I know better than him. God, give it to me or you're a bad God. The truth is we've all prayed, prayed that prayer in one form or another. Lord, I, I thought I'd be richer by this point. Lord, I thought I'd have a better career. We have prayed that prayer. It is the prayer of impatience. God does not call us to be impatient. In fact, impatience is a whole different religion than the one we have. Impatience is saying to God, I know better for my life than you do. In ancient times, we called this paganism. Here's the gist. You have a God. They need you to worship them. You need them to bless you. You learn how to manipulate them in order to get what you want. You give them offerings, they give you rain. You sacrifice your children, they give you riches. It's quid pro quo with this idea. I know what's best for my life, not you, God. I know what I need, and you give that to me. In fact, in paganism, the gods are capricious. They don't care about you. You're just a lowly human. Your job is to kind of get their attention, and then when you have their attention, uh, bribe them so that they'll give you what you need. Nothing has changed today. Most religions are based on the same principle. I give you A, you give me B. We are not pagans. First, I know you know this, but it has to be said. You can't manipulate God. You can't manipulate God. There is no amount of money, time, or talent you can give to the church or give to God that will get you more attention from God, that will get you more love from God, or get you more grace from God. Amen? Amen. God is not impressed by a million-dollar gift. Now, just to let you know, I'm not God. <laughs> I can be impressed. The true church does need a new roof. And I'm sure everybody on the board would be very, very impressed with a million-dollar gift. And the Scripture says that when you give to the church, you are blessed. So there is that, right? So what is patience? I want to define patience in this way. Patience is trusting God in all situations. Patience is trusting God in all situations. The Bible has a lot to say about patience. It tells us not to take revenge for a wrong we have suffered, not to return anger with anger, but return good for anger. It tells us not to grumble about the bad things people do to us or the bad things that come into our lives. You know, I think we struggle with all of those things, with complaining and with, with, with grumbling and, with, and wanting justice. I think we're made to want justice. God wants us to wait, to have patience. When we're pointed in the right direction, when we remember our purpose in this world, our purpose as a church, our purpose as a church, to reach every person on earth with the gospel of Christ. That's our purpose as a church. And, the and you know, think about that. Revenge and justice can kind of work in opposition to that. Our job isn't to give them judgment. That's God's job. Our job is to give them grace. Ultimately, it comes down to this. Do you trust God or not? Do you think God doesn't know about your boss? Doesn't know about your financial situation? Doesn't know about the love of your life who won't look at you twice? God wants you to learn something. Maybe you're put there because you need to teach your boss something. To reach him for the gospel. 
You're stagnant because God wants you to move into a different company or division, and you're just not motivated to do that. Here's what doesn't help. Grumbling. Complaining. I have the worst boss ever. Did you see what my boss did? Did you see what he did to me? I'm not saying that you can't share your frustrations. We are called to confess one to another. We're called to share each other's burdens. But in, in those moments, we have to listen to the other Christians telling us what's really going on. Are we complaining unfoundedly? Uh, do we need to change? Is there something else that we need to look at? When we share our burdens like that, our lives can change for the better faster than if we keep them cooked up or we just keep complaining and not listening to anyone. Now, you remember my example of the, of the pastor who uh, demanded God give him a good wife? We're not going to mention his name, right? A lot of people in that situation uh, would second-guess God. Some, sometimes they settle. I know what a biblical wife should be, but this woman, she's willing. So I'll take her instead, right? Some people marry outside the faith when they come into a situation like that. Sometimes the woman isn't mature. Sometimes she's mean or selfish or something else. But we compromise, so that God can keep his promise to us. And I'm married. However, if God doesn't come in at the beginning of marriage, it's really hard to shoehorn him in later. It's really difficult to do that. And then the marriage doesn't go as planned. Now, when I was young, I met some amazing women, but they wouldn't look twice at me. And when I discovered, what I discovered was God was delaying answering my prayer to make me a better follower of Christ. For some, that means putting marriage on the altar of God, saying, God, no matter what, I trust you. I had to do that. I had, to, I had decided that God felt that marriage wasn't for me, and I was okay with that. Did I love it? No. But I said to God, no matter what, I trust you. A few years later, uh, Jennifer walked into my life, and my whole new plan was ruined. But God's plan wasn't ruined, right? His plan wasn't ruined. Patience is not helped by grumbling and complaining. Now, the truth is, grumbling and complaining leads to murder. Ooh, why do I say that? Remember Cain killed Abel. It started because he was grumbling and complaining in his heart. That God looked in favor on his offering and not on Cain's offering. Remember that? The whole thing begins by cultivating grumbling and complaining. And then that progresses on to sin after sin after sin. Grumbling and com complaining is forbidden in the Old Testament. Why? Because it's a bad witness at first. I mean, who's going to want to join your church if you're grumbling about it and complaining about it? And second, it can lead to all sorts of other kinds of sin. Here's a man in, with Moses in Numbers. Why should Moses be the one who determines who gets all the gold when he conquers a city? Why, why is all the gold and everything going to the priests? I fought in that battle harder than the priests did. I mean, all Moses did was hold up his hands. I was the one putting my life on the line in the fighting. So why shouldn't I take a little of that gold and help my family? Achan said that right before the ground opened up and swallowed him and his family. Right? It leads to sin. This is impatience. This is saying to God, I know better than you what's good for my life. In the Old Testament, the word impatience means long nostrils. Long nostrils. Should I explain that? Yeah. yeah. I think about it this way. A person who's impatient tends to have short nostrils, right? Right? Impatience. I'm breathing hard. Long nostrils means I'm taking things easy. I'm taking a long, long breath. I'm not getting excited. I'm not getting bent out of shape. I'm letting life go slowly and looking at it slowly. A person who breathes slowly and purposefully uh, tends to be less angry. 
And the Word gives us a glimpse of how to reach for more patience in our lives. We are to play the long game and not the short game. In our culture, people say the ends justify the means. And what they mean by this, if you have the goal, if you have the right goal, it doesn't matter what you do in order to reach that goal. The Bible says the means are just as important as the ends. And if you use the wrong means, you will get the wrong end. There is no justification for sin or shortcuts or compromise in Scripture. There's no justification for them. We are to play the long game and not the short game. And the long game says, as we learned last week, we don't need short cakes, uh, shortcuts. We, we might need shortcakes, but shortcuts because we've already won the long game. Amen? 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 We've already won it. Jesus has died for, so that sin and death are defeated. There is no other enemy left. We have won the war, so we don't need to take any shortcuts in this life. God says, don't go to bed angry. Why? Because he's telling us, I've already taken care of the situation. Whatever happens, I'm in control and you don't need to worry. God says, don't be, ang be angry, but don't sin. Why? Why? Because God is telling us he's already taken care of the situation. And if it doesn't seem like it to us, we have to ask. Does God know the future? Wait, I'm going to ask you. Ready? You're going to answer that question. Does God know the future? Yeah. Yes. We don't know the future, but God does. So even though we may see something coming on the horizon, it may never reach us. Like Wyoming. I see it on the horizon. Man, we drove for hours when we came across here 10 years ago. Hours. And Wyoming was still way ahead. Man, thought we'd never reach it. But we did. God knows the future. I'm, so I'm going to say our definition of patience is trusting God in all situations. I do have to say that some scholars say patience is suffering without retaliation. I don't like that definition. I think it's more helpful to say to trust God because that's a positive action I can take rather than putting me at the center of everything. Now I'm suffering. I'm just going to suffer through this. That puts me at the center. When I trust God, I'm putting him at the center. I like that better. This isn't easy. The more we do it, the better and deeper our walk with God will be. Now the picture of impatience, we see this in 1 Samuel 13. Saul has a chance to break the power of the Philistines. He's got a large army gathered there. They've just had this huge victory because of the bravery of his son over the Philistines just in the previous chapter. And he's excited. Uh, he's excited to come and really defeat the power of the Philistines. Now, the problem is, before they can go out and fight the Philistines, they're supposed to make a sacrifice to God first. Samuel is supposed to meet Saul there on the mountain to make the sacrifice. And Saul waits, and Samuel doesn't come. He waits, and his men start to leave. He waits, and seven days pass, and still Samuel is not there. Now, a lot of Samuel's soldiers have said, if we're just not going to sit here and do anything, they start to leave. They start to go home. Because unlike the Philistines, there's not a professional army for the Israelites. These men have to go back and feed and take care of their families. And so wasting time just sitting there waiting isn't for them. Scripture says only a priest can offer a sacrifice to God. Now, pagan kings, anybody does it, right? Especially the kings. Kings did it all the time. That's not how Scripture says. Scripture only wants priests to do sacrifices to God. It's forbidden in Scripture. But Saul, Saul sees the greater good at stake. He forces himself to offer up sacrifices to God, even though it's a sin, for the greater good of defeating the Philistine. You hear it? And just as he's offering this sacrifice, that's when Samuel shows up. And he says, Saul, what are you doing? Saul said, the men were deserting. So even though I didn't want to, I offered up a sacrifice to God to keep them here so we could fight the Philistines. After all, you were late. And Samuel says, A wizard 
arrives precisely when he intends, Frodo Baggins. Wait a minute, I think that's the wrong book. I want to ask you the question. If Saul stood alone on that mountainside and only had God with him, could he have defeated the 50,000 Philistines? Yes. God's already won. If God's on your side, you don't need to worry about anything. Whatever happens in your life is in his hands. Now, the opposite of patience is revenge. Rather than trust God, I will take my life in my own hands and I will direct it. I will take the situation under my control and I will direct it. I will take justice into my hands and I will make them pay. We are not to do that. Rather, we are to trust God. How can I have more patience? 2 Timothy 2. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So how do we cultivate patience? One, we cultivate humility. We cultivate humility. How do I do that? First, don't always stand arguing and correcting people. A humble person does not argue and correct people. I, I want to tell you something that's true, right? People respond better to a kind word than a stern declaration. Decor, dec, thank you. Declaration. When my father gave me directions... He was always, always did it angrily. He was always mean. He was always yelling at me, right? So I fought and I challenged and I complained. And to the point when I got to be older, anything he said to me, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do it any way he said because he was so mean to me all the time. He'd say mow in straight lines, so I'd mow in circles. I figured if I'm going to be punished anyway, I might as well do something to be punished for. However, if my grandmother asked me to do anything, would you please walk on these coals? I would have done it without question. Why? She always had a kind word. And not only did she have a kind word for me, she coupled it with that thing, you know, love. She always coupled it. So no matter what she told me to do, I did. Kind words go further than stern declarations. Col so cultivate humility. Next, listen instead of speaking. Now, it should be the first thing on the list, but I know some of us have trouble with that, so I put it third. <clears throat> but we should listen. Don't deny that most of us in this room probably speak first before we listen. It's just how we are. It's just how human beings are. But before I hear the finish of the sentence, I've cut them off and started giving them the solution, even though I don't actually know what the whole problem is. We often do that. Listen first. And this also means that because a humble person listens first, they hear when someone's trying to correct them. And when you hear that, and it's true, we also have to admit it and follow through and apologize or change our behavior. In most conflicts, two people are involved. Me and the other person. How often do we ask, what is my part in this conflict? We only think about what they are doing, right? Next, remember your job. Remember your job to reach people for Christ. Have patience because our job isn't what we think it is. It is not to mete out justice. It's not to make sure everything works out. It's not to fix that person's life. Our job is to reach people for Christ. That is our job. The only Bible some people will ever read is you. 
Make sure you display your favorite passages in Scripture through your life. And I say this with a little trepidatious because I believe most of you don't have a favorite verse like, Behold, I will smite you with frogs, right? Which is Exodus 8.2, right? So most of us don't have that as our favorite verse. Most of our favorite verses are about love or forgiveness or strength or something like that. Live out your life verse. Our job as a church and as followers of God is to make God's enemies God's friends. Turn to your neighbor and said, I want to make God's enemies God's friends. Now turn back and say, you can start with me. I'll be your friend. So if there were any enemies in this room now, we're all friends now. Amen? Amen. All friends now. Fourth, be the gospel. Show kindness. Show forgiveness. Don't be in a hurry. The war has been won. There's nothing more we need do. Show mercy for the enemy. Jesus died for them as well as for us. As we come to this table, it is as a church, we are so excited and proud. Gary, can I ask you to come forward and just sit with these three here? Not sit, actually, I'm going to ask you guys to stand. I want to give you the right hand of fellowship and welcome you into our congregation. Uh, just stand right over here, that's all right. When we join a church, a church is supposed to be something more than a country club. Uh, it's like joining a family. We are brothers and sisters together in eternity under the guidance of one Father in heaven, one with our brother Jesus who obeys God as we are to obey and shares us his grace, his Holy Spirit, his righteousness, and his faith. I'm going to ask you guys some questions, and I'm going to ask you a question. I'm expecting yeses from all of you, so, but consider carefully what, we're, what we ask. So I ask you three, will you follow Jesus to the best of your abilities, bringing into our congregation your tithe, your talents, and your time? Will you follow and put your whole self on the altar of God and love your brothers and sisters as Christ loved us? Church, will you surround this, these brothers and sisters with love, with guidance, giving them out of your abundance and poverty, giving them your time, your health, your understanding and gifts for as long as they live? If so, say, I do. I, do. And I welcome you into the fellowship of Bethel Baptist Church, brothers and Sister, now you may be seated. Jesus, when he died, he showed patience. He went to the cross. He died for us, though we did not deserve it. Though we are at war with him, he still died for us. We come to this table and we remember God's patience, his love for us. And in some ways, it should help inspire us to show love for those people in our lives that we find it most difficult to love. For God loved us, and so we are to love them. May I have my deacons come forward, please? On the night that Jesus was betrayed... He blessed the bread, said, this is my body, eat this in remembrance of me. And he blessed the wine, he said, this is my blood, drink this in remembrance. Let us remember.
night that Jesus died, he broke bread and he said, this is my body, eat this and remember it. Let us remember. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood shed for you. Let us drink and remember his long suffering and his patience with us. It is the tradition of our church to close a communion service by standing and making a circle and walking by this basket. This back basket represents our benevolence fund, which is money that we use to uh, help people in our community. This month we help um, a, a homeless man who had trouble with his bicycle to get his bicycle repaired. And we do use it things like that to help people inside of our church and outside of our church. And so we would can ask you to consider as you come by the basket to give in support of these needs. Let us stand and make a circle. Marty, I, I put on deodorant this morning, Marty. There we go. That's good. We're getting there. We're getting there. There we are. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now may the Lord bless you and grant you patience, patience coupled with love so that we might reach people for him. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name and everyone said,